Welcome to Lecture 17 of BIB 102 New Testament Survey. This will be the last lecture before test number 4, which will cover Romans through today's lesson, which is 2 Corinthians. So let's get started. Roman Rule 1, the introduction to the book of 2 Corinthians. Now this is all going to be exactly like 1 Corinthians, so we'll go through there quickly. Letter A, this book was written by the Apostle Paul. No one is disputing this at this moment. Letter B, this book was written sometime between AD 55 and 56. And if you remember from the last lecture, Paul visited this church on his second missionary journey, stayed there for 18 months, and then wrote while living in Ephesus. Now this, we're going to find out, is technically his fourth letter written to this church. He wrote a letter first that we do not have. They responded to him. Then he wrote back, which is what we have for 1 Corinthians. Then they responded. He wrote back. And then... Finally, a fourth letter was sent to them, which is now what we call 2 Corinthians. And then letter C. This book was written to the Christians in Corinth. Now, this church was composed of mainly new converted Jews and Greeks, though it was predominantly Gentile. And this epistle was most likely delivered to them by a man by the name of Titus. And then Roman number 2. The purpose and importance of the book of 2 Corinthians. There are three primary reasons why the Lord inspired Paul to write this epistle. The first was to explain Paul's ministry. In chapters 1 through 7, he goes into great detail about his ministry and how he came to be the man he was then. And then letter B was to encourage generosity. In chapters 8 and 9, he's going to primarily focus upon being generous as believers. And then letter C was to enforce Paul's authority. In chapters 10 through 13, while ex after explaining his ministry and talking about generosity, he though, then goes into explaining the authority that God had given to him as an apostle and what made his writings so authentic was because of what God had done in his life. So now let's move on to the major teachings in the book of 2 Corinthians. Letter A. 2 Corinthians gives thanks to God's comfort through trials so we can comfort others. After Paul and Timothy give their greetings to this church, they then explain one of the great things for which to be thankful to God is his comforting us through trials so we can comfort others. Paul then explains that he knew troubles like they did since he was in trouble in Asia and, quote, pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even to death. And then letter B, 2 Corinthians cautions that Satan will use unforgiveness to take advantage of us. Paul was planning on visiting this church, but because some members of the church prevented him, Paul actually postponed his trip. This caused some of the members to harbor bitterness toward those who prevented Paul. But Paul points out that those who have caused the problems and sins which prevented Paul from visiting them should be forgiven. Because his refusal to come to them, he says, was punishment enough. Paul then goes on to declare that whomever they forgave, then he would forgive as well, and then cautions them against unforgiveness, since he says that this can be used as a device of Satan to get advantage over them. And then letter C, 2 Corinthians explains the gospel ministry. The first thing that Paul mentions is that preaching the gospel is pleasing to the Lord. Because of the gospel and because we preach the gospel, Paul says that we are a sweet savor of Christ unto God and even to those that perish. We're like that fragrant, fragrant smell of one of our favorite foods in God's nostrils. And then God is pleased with our actions by preaching the gospel and others are too when they get saved. And then number two, our lives are a living gospel to the unbeliever. As believers, Paul explains that our lives are letters or epistles not written with ink, but written with the Spirit of the living God. And in spite of this, we should not feel sufficient in ourselves, but only in God, since without Him we would not even be able to preach the gospel. 
you've ever heard this expression before, the only Bible some people may ever read is your life. Our lives are in a living gospel to the unbelievers, so we should act accordingly in order to draw them to it. And then number three, Paul says that failure to preach the gospel is likened to hiding it from the lost. On account of the ministry that God has given us, Paul says that we should not give up and we should live a consecrated, pure, holy life. But if we do decide to give up and not preach the gospel, then Paul says that it's like we are hiding it from the lost. We are hiding something that every single individual can benefit from. And number four, not even death should impede us from preaching the gospel. Paul says that even if our body, a temple on this earth is destroyed, then we have an eternal abode in heaven. After all, Paul says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This should greatly motivate us to tell more people about Jesus. And after all, Paul says in verse 15 of chapter 5, if Christ was willing to die for us, then we should be willing to live for him. And then lastly, number five, Paul concludes this section with a plea to live a life above reproach so the gospel will not get a bad name. Going back to what he previously mentioned about how the only Bible that someone may ever read is our own lives. If we, as professing believers in Christ, do not live accordingly, then that will give the gospel a bad name. Just think about current events right now and the attack on Christianity, not because of the teachings of Christ, but because of the actions of Christians. And then letter D, 2 Corinthians warns against being morally attached with unbelievers. The imagery used here concerns not being unequally yoked with unbelievers. And the yoke there is most likely talking about that wooden instrument that was done and given to donkeys and horses and various animals to link them together in order to plow a field or pull a carriage. We are not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, since, Paul says, righteousness and unrighteousness, light and darkness, Christ and Belial, and a believer and an unbeliever have no business being connected morally. Now, he's not saying to avoid them completely, since how else will we win them to Christ? The context goes on to say that we should come out from among them and be separate and not touch the unclean things. This pertains to our actions. If we are going to be true professing believers of Christ, our job is to witness to the unsaved with our lives and our actions. That means we cannot link up with them and do the same things they do, immoral, sinful things, because that will be a poor testimony on the gospel. And then letter E, 2 Corinthians admonishes cheerful giving. Paul admonishes the church in Corinth to follow the same example of some churches in Macedonia by giving liberally. Though this is not a command to do so, but Paul says it does demonstrate our love for others. This liberal giving follows the example of our Lord Jesus, who, though he be, was rich, became poor for our sake. And continuing in the theme of giving, Paul points out that those who give will never lack. The illustration used here is that of farming. He says if you sow sparingly, sow seed sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. But if you sow seeds liberally, then you will reap liberally. However, this giving, Paul says, should not be done in spite, but we should be doing it in love because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And then lastly, letter F, 2 Corinthians vindicates Paul's apostolic authority. Two things about this section. Number one. Paul says his authority was rooted in his message. Paul worried that this church might be tricked with false doctrine as Eve was tricked by the serpent. 
So he admonishes them to not accept another gospel that he did not preach since he was one of the chief apostles. He goes on to say, even if a false prophet's doctrine looked good, as Satan looks good himself, transforming himself into an angel of light, as do his, his uh, demons, Paul says they should still hold fast to his word. And then secondly and lastly, then Paul concludes by saying that his authority was solidified by his actions. They needed to remember that Paul was a Hebrew, an Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, more of a minister of Christ than most, and persecuted more than others. He goes on to list some of the persecution he received at the hands of individuals, but still did not let it stop him from preaching the gospel. He says that he was whipped too many times to count, in prison often, in th constant threat of death. He received 39 lashings from the Jews on five separate occasions. That's 195 lashings. He was beaten with rods three different times. He was stoned once and left for dead. He was shipwrecked three times and even spent a night and a day in the ocean. And then he says he's been in more peril, many more peril, than he can remember. And on account of that, he says, my talk is not just talk. He says he is practicing what he preaches. He is walking the walk. Just as a reminder, test number four will be in the next class period, and it will cover the book of Romans through the book of 2 Corinthians. So page 33 through page 42 in your student notebook. And that brings us to the end of Lecture 17 for BIB 102 New Testament Survey. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or need anything, please do not hesitate to contact me.